to call to order uh, this regular meeting of the Education and Neighborhoods Committee. I'm Paul Krikorian, the chairman of the committee, and uh, Council Member uh, Janice Hahn is with us. It's Tuesday, March 9th, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Zine, I'm sure, will be joining us shortly. I want to thank you all for taking the time once again to be with us today. Uh, today's uh, meeting will mainly be a continuation of last week's items, which focus on the done consolidation and funding issues. I don't think it's me, is it? <laughs> oh, it is. I'm sorry. That's so rude. Not at all. I uh, never had it on the ring. In fact, that reminds it. me. I better check my own. I did not recognize that. Okay. Oh, it was the mayor. Just kidding. Uh, Items uh, three and four on today's agenda will be continued until next week, given the press of time, uh, and we won't be taking discussion on those items today. So if you're here uh, to speak on those items, I would ask you that pl you please come to our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, general public comment will be at the end of all of the agenda items, and all public comment today will be limited, limited to one minute uh, per person on each matter. Uh, and then specific public comment we'll have uh, after discussion and uh, questions and answers with the departments on each uh, item. So roll call, please. Item number one, city administrative officer, city attorney, chief legislative analyst, and Department of Neighborhood Empowerment report on the following options. Feasibility of transferring administration of the funding program to either the city clerk, community development department, or other city agency to manage the funding program and cost savings. B, feasibility of a nonprofit taking over the funding program and cost savings. And C, feasibility of making Board of Neighborhood Commissioners a managing commission and moving Dunn staff onto the commission and cost savings. Thank you, and we are now joined by the Honorable Dennis Zein. Mr. Zein, welcome. Um, I'd like to ask the CAO's office to uh, come up and go over their updated report on these matters. <coughs> welcome. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilson Poon with the CAO's office. Um, we prepared a written report on um, some of the questions that are posed by your committee, um, specifically the cost savings and the timeline for implementing the mayor's proposed consolidation. We also, um, I believe, addressed some of the modifications um, that was suggested for the funding program. Um, and at this point, we still don't have a lot of details about the consolidation, so we did give some um, rough estimate. We can't provide any concrete numbers um, on the savings amounts. Um, there, are, there should be um, some savings from the elimination of positions. The mayor's proposal is proposing to transfer 16 positions. Um, Dunn currently has 43. So um, identifying those classifications will be important. There are some, I believe, some volunteer positions, um, and if, you know, if some new positions need to be created, they'd have to go through the Civil Service um, Commission to be allocated. Um, so there, would, there should be some savings from the elimination of um, redundant overlapping positions. Um, we also identified some savings from um, office space leases. Currently they occupy the office space on 2nd Street, uh, was it 340 East 2nd Street, and they're currently paying approximately 2000 a year to lease that property. 2000 a year? This says 200,000. 200, I'm sorry, 200,000 per year. Sorry about that. Yeah. Very, that's very cheap rent there. Yeah, cheap rent. <laughs> it's very cheap rent. Um, very small office space. Man. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> so with the, um, the transfer of the positions to the Garland building as proposed by the mayor's consolidation plan, um, we could possibly eliminate those costs. Um, however, um, we'd have to refer, defer to the city attorney for an opinion whether or not we can get out of the lease agreements um, with the vendor. So, um, Do we know how long that's for? I'm not sure. The, the lease agreement? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have the uh, city attorney talk about that uh, okay. in a moment. And okay. Um, as um, CDD indicated last week, there are some um, 
their additional costs for, um, as um, I think Mr. Sines indicated, um, some support positions. Um, as you guys heard last week, um, CDD is entirely grant funded and therefore um, commingling the general fund with the grant funds, um, you would have to, we would have to, the general fund would have to reimburse the grant for some of the uh, administrative support positions such as the AGM, such as payroll. Um, these are all costs that are captured in the cap rate that's prepared by the controller's office, so. And, and I want to stop you there for just a minute because I'm, I'm still struggling to understand how the same number of managers who are currently 100% funded under the grant funding program will take on these additional responsibilities which would then be general fund funded. Um, how, how is it that we are going to be able to find the additional time in their day to take on these new management responsibilities without incurring additional costs if they're 100% funded currently? I, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out the pie chart on this. And maybe CDD can answer that. Okay, that'd be great. Welcome back. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Um, Richard Benbow, General Manager of the Community Development Department. That is a very uh, interesting question you pose there, but currently uh, uh, we are 100% grant funded, as was indicated by Wilson. and. Um, um, uh, taking on these additional responsibilities are, are essentially general fund activities for which grant funds are ineligible to pay. Your question, however, relates to the time available. So the theory behind this is, is um, uh, we would find ways to be more efficient in our grant funded activities to free up time for staff to do um, a relatively small amount of work as it relates to done as compared to, you know, the rest of the work we do uh, in order to uh, do the activities that, that would be required for uh, those administrative uh, uh, duties that require, are required for done. Do you have any concern that in doing that and taking on those additional responsibilities and finding those time efficiencies so that you can appropriately administer the, the new managerial structure, mm -hmm. that you're going to be um, uh, reducing uh, the amount of grant-funded activities that you're able to well, provide to the city. I certainly am concerned about that. I, I, I'm not saying we've got it all figured out. I'm saying we will work to find a way to get it done and understanding how important this is to the city as well as our department, we'll look to find those efficiencies in in our work processes in order to be able to accommodate the administrative support that's needed for done. And let me just say how much I appreciate and respect that kind of can-do attitude, which we need right now more than ever, but there are human limitations, yes. and, and that's my concern, I guess, is that well, if people what, are already... What, one of the things that, that has happened thus far is that the CAO has unfro uh, unfrozen some positions that will hopefully allow us to expand our capacity to uh, accommodate the administrative functions of done. We have been reduced in staff, uh, well, ever since I've been there every year from a high of somewhere near 400 down to 272. And quite frankly, we were straining to get everything done with a staff of 272. <clears throat> but we did, ha we did have uh, positions that were frozen that will now be unfrozen that will allow us to expand our capacity and then that will enable us hopefully to be able to accommodate the administrative support we needed for done. And so if those positions are unfrozen, is that then an offsetting cost that would reduce the amount of savings from the reorganization if those positions are filled with general fund expense? Yes, it would. Okay. Uh, all right, now, um, you, you, Ms. Hahn. Yeah, I just, so you're actually gonna hire some folks is what you're saying. Well, we are in fact taking people off the general fund now. So these okay, would be. So these will be people you're taking these off. These are people that we're taking off the general fund. We're looking oh. for the folks with the requisite. So transferring. We're, we're like, transferring. We're tra okay. All right. Got transferring. it. Transferring. Okay. That have the requisite skills okay. that will allow us to expand our capacity 
in the areas that are needed to not only accommodate done, but as you know, we're taking on the Human Relations Commission, Human Services Department, Children, Youth, and Family. And so uh, have your grants uh, increased? or uh, This year we did experience an increase due to the uh, CDBGR funding as well as an increase in the uh, formula grants for WIA as well as block grant and CBSG. They so were all have increased. The extra, you have the extra money to cover these? Grants. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, the uh, the amount of the savings will not be able to be determined, as I understand your report, uh, until you actually can determine which classifications, uh, uh, until you identify the classifications that will be reduced and there are bumping issues and so on that all complicate the what the exact savings will be, I, I gather. Is that, that the problem? Right. So when would you expect that under the normal budget process that the um, that your office has suggested as the appropriate time to deal with these issues what would be the timing when we when we could expect those determinations to be able to be made well we, we've recommended in this report that this consolidation be vetted through the you know, handled through the budget process that way it's it's vetted through committee and council and at that time we can probably give more concrete numbers I mean the mayor's office has done a remarkable job uh, taking the leadership role here and organizing a working group and we've been meeting on a weekly basis it seems to discuss these details so I think once we get I guess better direction on which direction uh, which how to proceed with the consolidation we can start crunching the numbers and I'm um, looking at the cost savings and the um, the additional costs we'd have to consider so I guess I answer the question <laughs> well when would you expect that to occur well, I guess April 20th, when the mayor's budget is released, we can uh, definitely have something. And I mean, it's it's hard to uh, you know to say when we can get these numbers. It's this is really being driven by the mayor's office, um, and you know, we're not exactly sure which which direction we're, we're going with the funding program. There's there's so many different issues to that we still need to look at. Um, I mean, physically, if you want to just transfer people, or we can, we can definitely look. You know, those numbers would be easy to calculate. But when we're thinking about how much we're going, you know, what we're doing with the funding program, if we're looking at um, a nonprofit coming in, you know, there's so many different scenarios uh, with different, you know, costs associated with that. So. Okay. Um, Design. Sixteen are going to be transferred into CDD. That's they're going to be special funded, or no? That the, the, those uh, positions are are uh, scheduled to be paid for out of the general fund. Well, okay, Sixteen. The, the chairman asked a question regarding the balance. So you're you're reducing from they're going to eliminate twenty two, but sixteen are going to go over out of the general fund, which may have helped done in the operations from that section. So have you calculated the cost? For those 16? What you're going to absorb? Um, until it's um, determined what the salary level is for the 16 that we are um, uh, inheriting here, um, we wouldn't be able to give you an exact figure. I have, I have a list of job classifications. They don't exactly line up with our classifications. There has to be an analysis to determine what salary range these classifications have to uh, to be in in order to to calculate you know what what the number is what about allocation for space uh, that's something else that we're looking at now as we speak um, again this is one of several pieces that we're looking at we have staff coming over from another a number of other uh, commissions and boards and we are working on a seating chart now that will uh, tell us if we can get everybody uh, in the current facility that we occupy on Garland Street and that's our goal you have available space there uh, we do have empty cubicles I think we could accommodate 16 but we have not only that 16 we have some other departments and commissions that are all expecting to come in as well well rent and Garland aren't we or leasing Garland yes we're leasing Garland okay. good luck you're a good man who has the concept <laughs> 
So do, have you determined? <laughs> have you determined yet then whether we will be able to give up the Second Street facility, or that's will you our need goal. Additional that's our goal okay. is to uh, uh, design our space in a way that meets all the space requirements and uh, give everybody adequate working space and to accommodate everybody who who needs to be in the Garland Street building. Okay, Ms. Hunt. Well, I was to say, well, obviously, before you go to all that work, I think we've got to determine whether or not we can get out of the lease yeah. on Second Street. So yeah. that, well, that, que that question needs to be answered first before you go to all this work, because we may not be able to get out of that lease. and. Yeah, and then, and then, and then you know, it yeah. makes no difference. But, but yeah. conceptually, I want to be able to give you as much information right. as I can right. to help expedite a decision on when, how, where, because all those right. issues I know are critical. Right. I think for me, and I don't know if we're going to have um, the department done come up and discuss it. For me, it's really, I mean, obviously this is, um, I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, it's, I don't know how you're feeling, Dennis, but I'm, I'm feeling a little, um, conflicted about this. Obviously, on the Charter Reform Commission, this was the first department we had created in the city of Los Angeles in a very long time. And we really created this department to specifically be able to empower, you know, neighborhoods, neighborhood councils. I mean, it really was a, a far-reaching, idealistic, you know, ex was not an experiment, <laughs> not an experiment. But it, but it was a movement. I mean, it's a, it still is a movement, in my opinion. And this was a department that, I mean, I know the charter says we're allowed to, after five years, the mayor can transfer uh, department functions, you know, elsewhere. But, I mean, this really kind of, uh, I'm, I'm concerned how this is going to work. And for me, I want to know what those 16 positions are, I mean, are, and, and who they are. And is this going to actually be able to continue the work of neighborhood councils in this city? Um, I mean, whether or not the funding gets changed or, you know, whatever, you know, we, the, who are these 16 people? And are, are they on, on their own, you know, merged with CDD going to be able to accomplish what I think we envisioned? in 1997 was this real change in how the people of Los Angeles interacted uh, with their government, with land use issues, with improving their neighborhoods. I mean, who are, who are these 16? For instance, I, I saw there was two IT support positions out of that 16. Is that really what we need to be? Is that, is that critical that Dunn has two IT support people in CDD? Is that part of our mission? I, I guess I haven't really heard what the case that was made on, on what we're doing here. So that, that's Mr. still my, my, my that. big, big concern. How are we really going to do that? What's it going to look like? How, how is this really going to work? Well, let me, before Those you speak, let, let me just say I share concerns also. I also share the fear that 4,000 city employees are going to get a pink slip. Yeah, and I do too. There's no question we need I, to I have consolidation and put some money back to uh, reserve too. funds. I so, I mean, there's, a, there's a balance. And I know okay. that we created this to bring communities together, to empower communities. And I know that we've had some stumbling blocks along the way. We've had four or five general managers, four or five, five general managers, which well, is, which is a big turnover. But the fact of the matter is we need to realistically look at 4,000 city employees may not have a job. And that's the issue that we have to also recognize. At the same time, keep this moving and keep all the other aspects of government in place. I'll tell you, I get emails from the people that don't want to cut back the library hours. I know. People don't want to make any changes. They don't want their taxes increased. We've got to make some changes because there's really no option other than making some changes. But keep it alive and not just have it as a token aspect of what we're trying to do with galvanizing communities in Los Angeles. The 90 neighborhood councils that are currently on record as being certified and moving forward. I just wanted to make that statement. Yeah, and, and uh, of course that specter uh, of the current budget crisis and the risk of layoffs hangs over every single thing that we do now. Um, but on the other hand, before we change the status quo, we want to make sure that we're not changing for the sake of changing. We want to realize that there, in fact, are material savings to be realized by a consolidation, that there aren't unintended costs that uh, eliminate the benefit of those savings. And I think that's why we want to get into some of the weeds on this and really have a clear vision for how we're going to do this, because consolidation alone 
it doesn't guarantee a penny of savings, not one penny. Right. Um, it's, it's in how we implement that consolidation where we're going to realize savings or realize potentially increased costs and certainly, you know, a lot of chaos in the meantime. So uh, I think that's the, that's the reason that we want to drill down into this a little bit more than we, we might uh, under normal circumstances. So, uh, Mr. Kim, Ms. Hahn raised some questions about the 16 and what those functions are, mm -hmm. uh, why they are essential core functions of your, your department. Uh, can you comment on that a little bit? Sure. Bung Wan Kim, uh, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, thank you for those pointed questions. I think those are the right questions to be asking as we go through this process. Thank we you. had been working very closely with the mayor's office when uh, I received instructions that this was the path that the mayor uh, chose, is choosing. Um, largely, the functions that we've identified um, were based on a lot of neighborhood council input. We did a survey back in October asking them, what are the most important services that you need from the city? And uh, the, there were four top priorities. The first was education and training. Um, the second one was uh, help with outreach in terms of uh, communications, getting the word out, getting more people uh, aware of what neighborhood councils are and the mm -hmm. fact that there's one in, there's 90 across the city and anybody can participate. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, the third priority was um, facilitating partnerships between city government and neighborhood councils. So uh, city departments, obviously neighborhood councils have a very close role in terms of monitoring delivery of city services. Mm -hmm. so, and then the fourth one was um, assistance in terms of compliance with legal and ordinance and procedures. As you know, the city tends to get very complicated. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of neighborhood councils who have limited experience with government are intimidated. Mm -hmm. Aren't so, we? Um, <laughs> and so we, uh, that kind of assistance, um, they said was important. So. Obviously, um, the face of our department and the city to mo most neighborhood councils are the field staff. Mm -hmm. And we had 16 of uh, those folks whose jobs were to attend board meetings and provide uh, right. on the spot assistance when they, we need it. Right. That's probably going to be the most um, uh, uh, felt by the neighborhood council. Those are not being transferred, those 16 people. It's being proposed in the restructure to go down to six, six of those field staff with two senior project coordinators serving in a more oversight management role. So okay. the strategy under um, a 16 staff uh, function so will eight be. Eight of those people will be. Yeah, kind of they'll, we'll be doing a, a resource clearing house. Okay. So they won't be able to go out to board meetings. They will be uh, available eight to five no more evening meetings, most likely, and we'll rely a lot more on our website. So we've been working the past seven or eight months and with this notion that I think is probably a good thing for most neighborhood councils is they're saying, you know, we've grown up. You know, it's it was not like 10 years ago. Um, we can do a lot of things on our own, mm -hmm. but um, so we're moving towards a more of a self-help uh, approach as a city. When you go down from 43 to 16, I, I think that's the only choice that you have. So we've invested quite a bit of resources in developing an electronic library for our website. Um, we were hoping to roll it out in February, but we were impacted by staffing cutbacks. But we anticipate rolling that out in the next couple of weeks. It will also have training videos. So it'll have on-demand training um, that people can access on it whenever they want. And so those, that'll be the main function of the field staff. Um, the two IT staff, therefore, become very important okay. because um, the field, the staff will be responsible for updating information. One of the key things that we maintain is a board database. So how does the city communicate with 1,600 board members? Our database becomes pretty important function for that. Our funding program, the direction that we're pursuing several different options, but should the city decide to keep the function within the department, we're still looking at um, addressing a backlog of issues. And then we talked with uh, in committee last week about one option would be to, con to convert the entire system towards a purchase card system. U.S. Bank has a pretty sophisticated website, and it's a, it provides just, very. I just stop you and go back to. So basically, you're not really transferring functions. Is what I'm hearing. You've decided to change 
you've, you've absolutely changed the function of these done folks when they go to CDD. And see, I think that was always my feeling that when, you, when we did any consolidation or we did, you know, that the function had to ch sort of transfer. Mm -hmm. And what you're telling me now is you've completely changed the functions of these folks. We haven't so yet, but it's... It sounds like that's where you're going. <clears throat> that's the direction that we're working on now through these work groups. Yeah. So I think for me, I mean, I, I would really like to see that, late, which functions are now not going to be done and done right. ever again. That, I mean, so, and that, that's what I think we need to have really clear before we make these decisions. So basically these functions of these project managers or what I forget what we called them neighborhood empowerment Na analysts. Yeah, okay there that's gone yeah okay I mean I I'm glad we we had this conversation because you know I was always assuming that the mayor sort of had to show how functions were going to be transferred and that's not what we're doing we're transferring people but the functions are completely different when you go from 43 to 16 you have to look at yeah, so there's a lot of a functions that are not going to be picked up anywhere. They're not going to be picked up by CDD. They're not going to be picked up. They're just they're gone forever. So we're cha we're actually changing the way we're supporting neighboring councils. Uh, essentially, yes, but I'd also yeah. ha uh, would point out that uh, based on the charter, there are certain things that have to be done, and so we're looking at how those things can continue to be done while at the same time looking for efficiencies based on the limited staff and the idea that we need to reduce costs. So uh, um, I just want to be clear that everything that's in that charter is part of what's being planned to be transferred, but what we are looking at are more efficient ways to, to accomplish those things. Okay, go, you can go ahead. I just Aaron, Aaron Gross, Mayor's Office. Uh, I also just wanted to mention uh, the, the questions that you, that Councilwoman Hahn has about um, changing the functions, I, I think are, are fair questions. Yeah. Um, I think the, one, of the, uh, one of the things to note is, as, uh, as the general manager of, of Dunn was saying, is that neighborhood councils, uh, because it's, um, it's a 10-year-old department uh, and neighborhood councils are up and running throughout most of the city, um, that the needs of neighborhood councils have changed from when the department was created to now. And uh, so hopefully uh, with more online functions and hopefully with a more streamlined uh, functions that we will be able to provide the, the services that are needed um, now, that the, now that the necessary services are different. What's the youngest neighborhood council? The youngest, I believe, is Westwood, Westwood. Neighborhood Council. How old? Which is, uh, has not yet had its first election. Right. Barely crawling. Correct. So they're Not even a toddler. Wilmington, that's the senior. That's right. Yeah. So we anticipate no new neighborhood councils. Is that basically what we're saying too? No, there there are four or five oh. uh, forming groups that oh. are in different stages of application to the city. Oh, very interesting. Okay. If I could go yes, back, please. a question you asked earlier, yeah, I didn't I have the information. Subsequent to that, my assistant general manager, Rhonda Gaston, came in, and as I said, staff was, has been working on this. Um, our estimate of the uh, cost for uh, the staff, including GASP and everything, is $2,629,000. That would be for the 16 positions. And we do have titles and salaries that match those titles, and it would come to um, a little over 2.6 million. Uh, following the transfer. Yes. And those, those would be our costs that would have to be allocated. Okay. And how does that compare to the current costs of those 16 employees? What, what are you doing with the current costs? Uh, last year's approved budget was 3.3. That's for yeah, But that's much more than the 16. Yes. So for the 16 that would transfer over, do you have an estimate or an assessment of what the cost of those employees well, ours are? Ours, but I, we want to par compare apples to apples. This is space, this is uh, gasp, rent, 
parking and everything. This is totally loaded. I think that 3.3 represents. Correct. It don't, did not include all the overhead all those and, and, and expenses. Well, I think that goes to the nub of the question, really, um, at least in terms of cost savings, is comparing apples to apples. If we have 16 that are in Dunn and we have 16 uh, following the transfer in your department and you have a cost estimate for that, we need to know what the cost estimate currently is for those 16 all in, soup to nuts, so that we can compare that and see whether there is any savings because of the consolidation. Yes, sir. Or at least we ha we'll have, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say that black and white, we, so that we know whether we, there will be savings realized from the transfer of those employees. There may be other savings as well, but, but at least in, in assessing this, I think it would be instructive to know what the current cost of those positions would be as well. One minute, one more. Yes, Ms. Hunt. Um, again, I, I, the more I hear, the more concerned I am. Um, now, Bongwan, you, you are stepping down, is that correct? That is correct. I'm helping with the transition. How long? When the appointment of the, um, the proposal is for the CDD and Dunn General Manager, uh, Richard Bembo, to be appointed by the City Council. How long will you be overseeing this transition? Um, up until that point. Oh, oh okay, what, when is that point? He says for, for uh, mayor's, mayor's office. Um, I know the CAO had mentioned that the intent was for this to happen uh, in the new fiscal year. I think the mayor is interested in, uh, in seeing it happen as quickly as possible, if possibly before uh, the new fiscal year begins. Um, I think that's a question of whether that's, whether that's possible or not, um, what, what can happen uh, budgetarily in the current fiscal year. Yeah. But, the, but the mayor's intent and hope is that right. it happens. I mean, I, 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 again, I feel like this is the road we're going on, but I'm, I'm less concerned about kind of how we do all this transfer, then, then what happens? I, I'm, I'm very concerned that you will not be around to like kind of how are these 16 people still fulfilling the mission of done and who's going to pay attention to that going to be? But I don't think you necessarily n know that because that really hasn't been your, your focus. Councilwoman, one of the, one of the positions that uh, that is envisioned in the mayor's proposal is an executive director of the Office of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, that one. would be one, right, one. That would be within uh, the Community Development Department slash done um, within the new department, and that person would oversee uh, what happens next and how the how the new staff, uh, not the new staff, but how the new configured staff uh, deals with the job at hand. And who is that person? Uh, it hasn't been named yet. It would not, at least as in the mayor's proposal, it would be. Uh, someone appointed by the general manager of the new department, um, and um, you know, I, I think that uh, whoever that general manager may be um, would would I, I assume, and I would I would would defer, but w would assume would uh, would appreciate any suggestions that uh, my office would have, any suggestions that your offices would have. Bong Wong Kim. Oh, um, I, I, like I said, I I'm I I'm just very concerned, and I don't know if that's something we want to. Keep him on through. We're beyond that. You know, are we beyond that? All right. I, I'm. And, we're, and we are also. We're I, also talking about uh, about uh, with within the within the timeline. What sort of things we can do with current staff? Whether there's anything creative we can do to to keep knowledgeable staff on? And that's just ongoing discussions that we'll we will let you know as as we have suggestions. Okay. Noncommittal as that is, but but it, but we we are looking to keep some of the knowledge base. Um, through the transition period, if, if possible. Well, I think, yeah, I'm just gonna, like I said, the functions are basically gone. <laughs> so, I, you know, I don't really, I'm, I'm not envisioning how this is going to work, but. And, and just to maybe build you on can that, tell me point, that yeah, that I think it's not just the knowledge base. I think yeah. a lot of the, the um, concern that's been expressed about the consolidation by the neighborhood councils themselves is with a structural change, it, it will detract from the uh, the administration's focus on advocacy for neighborhood council and neighborhood empowerment because there won't be a single focal point f with that mission. Now there will be this one, one, one position, the, the, <laughs> I, I'm, the acronym, O-N-E, one position. There. Um, and, and I suppose the idea is that, that that will be the, that will be the fo 
focus of that position is to be the advocate for, for neighborhood empowerment. True, yes, but also the field staff that will, that will come over, obviously a much smaller field staff, will be available to neighborhood councils uh, on an as-needed basis as opposed to uh, being at every meeting, um, which I, I think is more efficient, especially because neighborhood councils, many of them, most of them are up and running and, have, and understand how the process works, or a lot of the processes work. In addition to that, um, I think uh, my my supervisor, Deputy Deputy Mayor Larry Frank, um, mentioned in a previous uh, in a previous hearing uh, that that there will be added uh, added pressures and demands on both the mayor's office and council offices to help neighborhood councils. I think that's that's just kind of a reality of the situation that that there is uh, a lot of support the neighborhood councils need, and and some of that with the consolidation with the economic situation. That, that I think some of that will fall on the elected officers. Right, and I'm worried about that because frankly the mayor, you know, is, I mean, and, and again, this is, this is part of what we're doing in this crisis. There is a lot of stuff being transferred to the mayor's office right now, a lot. And again, I, I think everybody's okay with that. Um, I, I, the, we, we are consolidating a lot of stuff in the mayor's office and I, I'm just wondering, you know, how, again, there's human limitations. Was there any thought of having flexible work hours for some of these, uh, the eight, like from working from 12 to 8 p.m. instead of 8 to 5? Because I don't know how valuable they're going to, I mean, neighborhood councils are volunteer, right? Those, they're, they probably do the majority of their work in the evenings. So I don't see how um, that's going to be all that helpful to them to be on the job from 8 to 5 as opposed to maybe 12 to 8. Well, that, that's certainly something we could explore as we go through this process, transition process. Um, but I think when you go down that many bodies um, divided by 90, it's physically impossible to be right. there at enough neighborhood council meetings. We may want to think about keeping a few positions available at night to deal with neighborhood councils that are struggling. Because I think that's one of the concerns um, that we have to be, be paying attention to is that in some ways, our department served as a safety net for neighborhood councils when they had groups that were becoming dysfunctional and uh, were not performing their community obligation. We walked through them through a process where basically we put them on probation mm -hmm. and eventually led to the commission to decertify. We've only done that three times, so mm -hmm. it's not a huge problem, mm -hmm. but it is something that I'm concerned about as we go through a redu reduction in staff, especially in low-income communities of color who um, don't have as many volunteers or resources, I think that's gonna be something uh, important to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, just reiterating uh, the general manager's point, with the neighborhood council survey and the four, the four main issues that neighborhood councils seem to, seem to need and the, the, um, the, the uh, assistance from the department being the education and training, the outreach, facilitating the partnerships and legal compliance, uh, a lot of those things are things that can hopefully be done uh, from, a, from like they said, either an electronic-based or people sitting at, a, sitting at a desk and answering questions. I think a lot of those questions may come up in neighborhood council meetings, but I think the, the answers need to be more thoughtful and maybe something, you know, sitting, sitting having a longer conversation than on the side of a neighborhood council meeting. Um, so hopefully that field staff and that executive director will be able to serve that function um, that the neighborhood councils have identified as their, their highest priorities for this department. I would also like to add that a, um, there were three positions specifically designated for volunteer management, and that's something that the department has been working on in response to a lot of, you know, with ten, this neighborhood council system being 10 years old, there's a lot of experienced people who said, you know, I want to help mentor newer board members. So um, we're putting together a work group of neighborhood councils with the, um, really stressing the importance of getting as much education and assistance out there as possible, because if you front end a lot of the education, then we're going to have less problems on the back end. Now, um, that's a, I think Ms. Hahn's questions provide a, a segue uh, to the um, city attorney's report um, because there have been concerns expressed about whether this consolidation in itself is, is permissible under yeah. the charter. Um, second, if there's an elimination of essential functions, yeah. is that permissible uh, under the charter um, and also whether there would be uh, yeah. whether the there would be legal the legal opportunity to transfer some of these responsibilities for day-to-day -day oversight to bonk for example um, so have have you had an opportunity mr. King to 
Yes, um, and, and I know you would hope for something in writing, but we could not uh, accommodate given the protocols in our office and the crush of work. But uh, with respect to, to one, indeed, um, or 1A on the agenda, uh, you can transfer uh, a charter-created uh, department uh, and uh, board and the general manager position to the, uh, an ordinance-created CDD in this case. There's no problem with that. You just cannot eliminate those roles, those, those. Functions? Well, actually, y you can't really eliminate the functions. Uh, the functions, though, for instance, of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment are set forth in Section 901. Right. They talk about arranging Congresses, arranging training, assisting right. neighborhood councils. Uh, that's uh, not, they're not real, I mean, they're specific in that they're supposed to be assisting, aiding, helping, uh, and uh, the, the general manager's role is uh, set forth in 510. He's supposed to be, he or she is supposed to be uh, managing. The Board of Neighbor Commissioners, as I mentioned at the last meeting, is not a managing commission. I uh, sent you a uh, a piece that we did on that uh, to the Neighborhood Council Review Commission. So uh, the bottom line is, is that you can't eliminate, if you will, the position of general manager. I mean, you can certainly merge it, but you can't eliminate those uh, positions and the responsibilities that the Charter has created. That doesn't mean that CDD can't, as a department called CDD, and neighborhood empowerment can't uh, perform those functions, but you just can't eliminate those positions and those functions. I, I hope that helps. So, since Section 903 specifically mandates that there should be a general manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, is there a way that a consolidation can be done to still meet that very specific requirement well, that even goes so far Mr. as job title. Mr. Bembo, in this case, would be the general, general manager. manager. So he would be serving the function he as general manager of two departments. He would be serving the function of general manager, yeah. Um. And is there something also in that section that talks about how before we, the ordinance that we do this with must uh, lay out how these functions will be transferred? I mean. I thought that's also what, I mean, it has to be very, before the city council votes on it, the ordinance must specify how, the, this, how these functions will be performed in this. Well, we, our office has been working on a, a draft ordinance for the right. mayor's office, and essentially uh, we're repealing <laughs> The, right. the articles and, and right. essentially moving them wholesale over to um, But we're really not. CDP. I mean, listening today doesn't sound like that to me at all, not even close. So how, I, I'm just curious to know how this will look in an ordinance. Well, as I said, we're, we're transferring every uh, – you know, we're basically transferring these functions in a newly created department called well, CDD. Yeah, we're not really. But Councilman, I think, I think the question you're asking is how is this, how is this going to work? Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, 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 that too. Good I think question. Is, I think it's a fair question, yes. Yeah. Um, and I think um, uh, because, uh, uh, b because the charter is not that specific about what those functions are, um, and a lot of those functions have come through subsequent ordinance. Right. Uh, and again, because the department and the neighborhood councils have changed and matured. Right. Uh, I think that what you're, what you're seeing and what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the functions that were envisioned by the charter commission and by the, right. by the original charter uh, are not the same as what, as what the mayor envisions now. And I think that's, I think that's fair to say. Uh, and I think the mayor would admit that and say that because the department neighborhood councils have matured that the functions are the fun necessary functions of this department or this division within the department, uh, sorry, this department, uh, are, are different. And so I think that what the mayor will be presenting or bringing forward with the transmittal with the draft ordinance will explain and we'll, we'll do as much as we can to explain beforehand what those positions are, what they'll be doing, 
because you're right, you're, you were kind of defining a new, a new department. It's not a new department. Uh, it has yeah. This, it has this because it has it. Right. Because it has this you are not it. actually just merging this department and all of its current functions with CDD. Correct. We're right. We're we're updating. We're updating a charter a charter required department. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and many yeah. of those uh, duties that they perform are set forth in ordinances. So obviously the ordinances can be amended or right. kept. True. One of the things I would like to know is since you keep talking about um, grown up neighbor councils and yet we're talking, there, there may be four out there that are maybe looking for them, I would certainly like to see that spelled out. And I, and I think the, the staff in CDD would like to also see, you know, because you're, you're, you're sort of saying we're updating it, we're all new functions because we don't really need those functions anymore. And, but yet what we're hearing is you might need those functions if there's, four new neighborhood councils coming online. Who's going to do those? How do you see the 16 now going back and performing, you know, you know, growing up a new neighborhood council? Well, and there are, and I think those I mean, I just like, to, and I think everybody would just like to see that. I mean, I think, that, and I think that would be important for, for, you know, Richard. I also think it would be important for the staff to understand that that still is a function that, that I think is important. In fact, maybe one of the more important ones. I mean, look at how much effort and time we have spent on forming neighborhood councils. It's been a lot of work. You know, and, I'll, I'll and, I, and I think we can't just dismiss the fact that, you know, we're not going to have new neighborhood councils. True. And I, I think you're right. I think those functions are, are necessary uh, for the fledging neighborhood councils. Um, fortunately, there are less of them now than there were I agree. five years ago, ten years ago. But uh, another, another aspect that I think will help with those fledgling councils Again, not to imply that 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 function is not necessary for the city to provide, is that um, those neighborhood councils that have more history and more experience have actually been very helpful with fledgling neighborhood councils. And I think Mentoring. Not only with the with the volunteer component of the new configured department, but also neighborhood councils themselves have been right. very helpful. And that might be nice to be spelled out. Fair enough. Absolutely. Um, did, uh, did you have something further on those yeah, points? Well, I just wanted to add with respect to 1B, um, I do have a meeting tomorrow with Mr. Gross that... And, and 1B is oh, the discussion of the transfer, the potential transfer of the fu uh, administration of the funding program to a nonprofit outside uh, entity. Right. The, the, w as a general proposition, the, the Charter prevents using a fiscal agent or sponsor, if you will. However... Uh, we've been trying to nail down, if you will, from the mayor's office what exactly they have in mind. That has changed a little bit over time, and so hence we're meeting tomorrow to try and it's a moving target in terms of a, a legal analysis. Uh, but we're willing to listen and to see if they can come up with something that crea is creative but is lawful. <laughs> and this is just a function of the funding. Mechanism. Yeah. Yes, and, and right now the general manager is responsible for administering the fund, which is 5.517 of the admin code, and and so that's the that's their responsibility, and that would typically that typically follows from a responsibility that you have when you have a a, a, a non-managing board and a and a managing a department that is managed by a general manager. Right. Uh, and then, uh, so, well, so okay, that's a work in progress because the proposal itself is still kind of a developing work well, in yes, progress. Well, yes. First it was sort of nonprofit and granting. Now it's 90 nonprofits. I, 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 Mr. Gross mentioned that he ha that they had some other ideas in mind. So, so we have a meeting set up for tomorrow. Hopefully we can um, um, explore I, anything that they have to offer. Can I ask how many regard. people currently manage that funding? of neighborhood councils, the fund? Um, we're currently at, at the max, it was nine full-time staff, and now we're down to um, three for three. processing, yes. And so we're having to cobble together um, staff time from other positions to make do in this transition period. But with So we couldn't, there is not enough grant funding to transfer three more people to your department <coughs> to manage this funding well it it wouldn't be grant funded 
this would be money oh. that would be uh, come from the general fund to manage that function. Why? It, 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 well, if I may, Peter King, City Attorney's Office, but there, there was Why? some early language put in, uh, put in to ordinances and so forth about grant funding. But this is not a typical grant. These are appropriations made by the city to this fund. This no, no, no. I'm talking about the amount. people. Couldn't we get three three of these people to be transferred oh, into CDD, their salaries grant funded to, to manage this? Yeah. But and the reason as is opposed to right. going out for been. all these nonprofits. Currently, in our in our staff you know plan saying? for no, the I 16, okay. there would be two people who would perform that function. Our expectation is that those two staff people would be fully fully funded from the general fund. There, there needs to be a firewall between our grant funded activities and general fund activities. We would, uh, spending community development block grant funds, as an example, would be an ineligible cost to administer the funding program for neighborhood councils. And the difference between how we've been operating up until now and what we're trying to do during the transition is to come up with a very lean and efficient way of administering. But these other 16 are going to be grant funded. No, no, no. general fund. None will. That entire two point something million dollars will be out funded. of the that's, general. That's fund. correct. That's correct. The um, reason being that neighborhood, the neighborhood council program is not a federal program that's eligible for grant funding, which is what where the administrative costs of most of their managerial personnel is now assigned to the administration of federally provided grant, grant programs funds. yes cdbg and otherwise um okay I think that was, I was gonna say, uh, aaron gross mayor's office i the intent is to with the streamlining with trying to cut costs as much as possible is to provide for staff to oversee uh, a uh, the the funding program for neighborhood councils th that's funded through the, funded through the general fund, but uh, has the assistance neighborhood councils is necessary at the same time has the requirements and constraints and oversight that is required for taxpayer for taxpayer dollars, which is what we're talking about. Uh, you know, and if we can do that with less people, either through uh, in house in the department, great. If we can do it with a, a nonprofit. Uh, Great if that you know if that's legal, but there's a couple of different ideas. The intent the intent is to provide that funding program to neighborhood councils with the appropriate amount of oversight uh, that that the taxpayer dollars deserve. Does that make sense? This whole thing doesn't really make sense to me. It, it makes sense, but it, it obviously presents a great challenge because already, as we have diminishing staff levels in Dunn, we're already facing significant accountability challenges with the funding program as was uh, evidenced by the audit you know, that the controller performed and so if we're reducing that down to two people to, or two FTEs in the uh, in CDD it's a I have concerns about whether that's sufficient to maintain the level of both accountability and service to the neighborhood councils and quick turnaround of the funding program and, and so on as well but you know, I'm I'm agnostic. I'm still waiting to to see how that's how that's uh, going to work. Um, finally, Mr. King. Oh, oh, one, I, I one just wanted to, one point bef before we forget the CAO's interdepartmental correspondence that raises the issue about the lease and uh, depending on what's in the lease, if there's a subletting or an assignment provision, obviously we could try and do this during these, you know, the current economic situation. Otherwise. Uh, We'd be in breach to to run out on on the lease. When, uh, I'm sorry. When does the lease term end? 2011. Uh, 2011. Oh. What month? September 2011. September. So as we sit here today, without further information, uh, we will save nothing on the elimination of the lease because we're on the hook for it through 2011, anyway. It, unless we unless find we a can find a, a, somebody to assign it to or sublet to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Now then the last sort of ministerial point is um, you had discussed, Mr. King, that there are many interrelated ordinances and so on that have sprung up uh, in the administration of the, of the program over the years. Have you yet developed a, a kind of a 
game plan for what ordinances will need to be amended if we do the if we go forward with the consolidation and what would be your um, vision for how how we do the actual amending of those ordinances and charter if necessary what would be the timeline for that have you started to make any progress on on actually uh, drafting of the implementing ordinances where do we stand on that yes we we do have a draft um, I, sh I should say uh, first of all we had to repeal articles 1, 2, and 3 of Chapter 28, Division 22 of the city's admin code relating to the department. We had to create three new articles in the admin code, Chapter 19, that has to do with CDD. Uh, we then have about approximately 10 new sections. We uh, are moving the two trust fund sections. They'll be amended. And there's a contracting section that will be uh, will be amended. So essentially, we're moving all of this over into CDD. Now, as was mentioned earlier, you have um, uh, HRC and HSD, and uh, there, there, there. We're we're internally we're trying to figure out without running out of articles and sections, we're trying to figure out where, uh, where they, which one's going to come first, because that'll affect the actual numbering that we use internally. But um, we're, we're pretty, f <laughs> that's what's been a lot of the crash recently. We're pretty, pretty far ahead on that, and we just need to uh, get the sign-offs and uh, uh, transmit it to the mayor's office the draft and then they of course will look at it and make their suggestions okay uh, if there's nothing else Ms. Hahn, Mr. Zine, on this matter thank you all very much um, we have one card for public comment on item one that is from uh, Jim McQuiston Mr. McQuiston. Oh, it's not a, it's not your name. Oh, I can tell from where you yeah. can't very well. Welcome, sir. Jim McQuiston. You might say I'm the third member, although I wasn't on the Charter Commission, but I've gone all the way with this. Uh, I would have, uh, I would say, you know, the city attorney some time ago said, Maybe we made the wrong turn when we got up this originally in the ordinance. Uh, the, the charter really envisioned private attorneys general, not part of the city, so that they would have the ability to monitor the delivery of services, which they do not have right now, although the charter says they're supposed to monitor. That's their only job. Uh, as far as the funding is concerned, uh, You'll find also in the council file my opinions on all those issues, so I'm not going to repeat them here. But uh, I must say that the city, the, the idea of neighborhood councils was to replicate the Bowron Good Government C Commission, which was what cleaned up our city a long time ago. I remember that. We don't have that now. The mayor and the city attorney then conspired to make a corrupt city. And we wanted an independent neighborhood council system so that that wouldn't happen again. Because this is the exact same charter that we had under the Shaw regime. And if we go back and think, look, let's, let's just make them private attorneys general, we really don't need funding from the city. We've had much success with people outside the system actually attacking the city and getting good government. So we don't really need that. What we really need is independence. And in rewriting this, I submitted long, long time ago a revision of this ordinance so that that would happen. Okay. And the city attorney has it. I think uh, all the people except you, I would be glad to give I it will. to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, which does exactly that and at no cost to the city. 
they can Very apply good. for grants if they need them. I, I, but they I really don't to need them. that from you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So, there's no others. If there's no other speaker on item number one, um, there's no action required on this item at this time. It sounds as though uh, a number of the plans for implementation of this are still very much in the works. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. City Attorney, you're meeting uh, with the mayor's office tomorrow. I understand. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, uh, at our next regular meeting in two weeks. Um, if uh, we could have CAO and CDD back here again to report on progress of the development of the consolidation plan. Um, and I'd like to ask the city attorney to come back um, at that time with uh, some meat on the bones, ideally a written opinion if you could by that time on the legality of the tran of a consolidation of this department, of these departments. Uh, the legal parameters on our uh, appropriating, uh, not appropriating, but transferring the funding program responsibilities to a nonprofit uh, entity, and, um, and then the list of the codified ordinances that are going to need to be uh, amended and how those will be, um, how those uh, policies and, and functions will be uh, let me start again. The list of the codified ordinances that relate to this uh, uh, proposed consolidation um, so that we can have a timeline for how the council needs to proceed on, on those as well. Uh, you've already opined on the lease. I don't think it's necessary to do anything further on, on that. Um, and if there's nothing else that we'll just continue this item then until uh, our regular meeting two weeks from now. Uh, that brings us to item number two on the agenda. Item number two is a done CAO reports relative to the transfer and implementation of a rollover, transfer of rollover funds to the unappropriated balance account subject to honoring contracts, committed projects, ongoing rent and leases, and unpaid bills upon providing documentation. All right, Mr. Kim, welcome back. I'm neighborhood Empowerment, pursuant to the council motion regarding the um, treatment of rollover funds, we have an initial tally of the records that were submitted. And um, this is a preliminary figure because um, we have still have to go through about 50% of the documents that have been submitted. Um, many neighborhood councils didn't quite listen to our instructions, and so we have to go through a lot of paperwork to make sure that um, the requests are in conformance with uh, council policy. But currently, the prelim preliminary figures indicate that a total of $933,000 um, of requests were submitted. Um, of that 930, approximately 780 um, seem to have complied with council directive, and uh, roughly 154 uh, did not comply with council directive. Mm. So um, that's going to be a moving target as we go deeper into the documentation, but um, you have requested that we give you an update. Thank you. And, and of the 154, what were the uh, areas of noncompliance? What sorts of requests were those, and why did they, were they not in compliance? Um, some examples are that they didn't submit uh, board um, meeting minutes that documented that the board took an action by a certain date. Um, some of them didn't have, uh, they claimed that they were demand warrants, but they weren't invoices that were submitted. So lack of proper documentation is pretty much what, the, um, what disqualifies those. Will those neighborhood councils that submitted the, those requests have an opportunity to provide additional documentation then to justify the requests that they've made that you've initially determined not to be in compliance? Um, we will be following up and submitting um, additional or requests for additional information. Okay. Since we um, do have the timeline that was established by the council, as long as we're meeting that timeline, um, we feel that we, um, we can follow through to make sure that we're doing the due diligence on our side to make sure that valid requests are being honored. Okay, so um, what would be the, 
remaining balance then as it stands now that would be eligible for uh, transfer to the UB? Um, by my math, it's the 1.6 figure would be subtracted by 930,000, so that would leave maybe 700,000 to be transferred to the UB, roughly. And then as you know, the council directive also said that after 20 days, the remaining um, third would be taken to the reserve fund and then by Mar uh, April 20th would be the last day that the funds would be depleted and um, all unspent or unclaimed funds would be uh, taken back to the reserve fund. Of the 780,000 or so that you initially determined to be compliant with the council's uh, direction, can you give a further breakdown as to which categories uh, those funds fall into, whether rent, uh, prior reimbursement of prior submitted expenses, uh, or uh, programs that have been identified in, in prior minutes but not yet uh, requested for funding? Uh, we don't have a, a further breakdown um, because the, the deadline was um, yesterday. And so uh, one of my staff stayed up to 1 a.m. trying to go through all the documentation so we could give you the best data that we could provide. But as I said before, we still have to go through about 50% of the documentation to make sure and confirm um, whether they were following policy, uh, council policy or not. Very good. Well, tell him or her that we appreciate it. And, uh, and then we'll look forward to having a further discussion about this in the next meeting as well. Jack Jacqueline Mendez, our funding program manager. So you can, she's here in the audience, so you can thank her yourself. Thank you, <laughs> Ms. Mendez. Uh, um, all right, well, let's take public comment on item number two then. Um, the first speaker will be uh, Ida Talaler, Tal uh, followed by Hugh Harrison. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I feel like um, a goldfish in a fishbowl. Fish you open your mouth and time is out. Uh, where does one, I am a member of a neighborhood council. I've had my vote revoked. I have not had a grievance hearing. And I think to come here and be told you can't speak, then where do we speak? Also, all of these funds that are moved left, right, and center, we have not discussed it at board level. The, the treasurer has not provided six quarterly reports, Greater Echo Park Alicia Neighborhood Council. What do we have? We have not had that figure. I have asked done for it. I have not received it. I think that there is a lot of fictitious figures that are given, figures that are biased, and I think neighborhood councils, then boards are owed the factual information from done before it is accepted. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. And you will never be told in this committee that you don't have the right to speak. Um, and in fact, if you'd like to come back during general comment and speak further, you, you're welcome to, and you will always be welcome to provide any written comment that you want as well. It's just that we have to manage the time. So thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, the next speaker is Hugh Harrison, followed by uh, Jim McQuiston. Mr. Harrison, welcome. Thank you. Hugh Harrison of the Venice Neighborhood Council. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that in our situation at the moment, uh, we've been totally frozen because of the uh, allocation of funds that we had appropriated and um, specifically indicated from both the 0708 budget and the 0809 budget for community improvement projects, which took an extremely long time to fund. Uh, all those costs, which were eventually paid by demand warrants this fiscal year, have been charged against our 45,000. And so we've been told basically we can't spend any money, which means we'll be able to do no outreach for the election in April unless we get this resolved. And so uh, my only point with one minute is that this be done as quickly as possible because so, we need to be able to do outreach for the election. OK. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Jim McQuiston, followed by Russell Brown. Jim McQuiston, one of the difficulties that neighborhood councils have, which I have uh, seen, is conflicting statements out of done, so no one knows exactly which way to go. It depends on the, the time of day, really. Uh, it's a good indication of why neighborhood councils really have to be independent so that they have charge of their own affairs and the responsibility that will come from whoever is funding them, themselves or someone else, that they have to have good, accurate financial data available to everyone. And you're not gonna get that as long as you treat them like children because they expect to be treated like children and they are not going to have this. Uh, Bonk, though, in my opinion, has been very, very lax. You compare what, you, what uh, Budget Finance asked to what uh, the, the uh, city offices respond to practically daily, and yet you can't get these answers out of Bonk, and I think that's uh, an indication that Bonk is not being administered properly. Thank you, sir. The next speaker is Russell Brown, followed by Laura Myers. Russell Mr. Brown, Brown Downtown LA Neighborhood Council. Um, I have also some concerns about the rollover funds. We've had situations where Dunn uh, delayed for significant periods of time paying invoices and then it was rolled over into the next fiscal year, which made us have an extra rollover and they've swept the money and they've, they've actually been quite arbitrary in where they're, which fiscal years they're accounting for certain things, certain expenses, are never reversed back to the previous year, even though it was done responsibility to pay for it. Um, specifically, we have $26,000 in rollover funds. 14,000 of that we budgeted last summer in May to put in our present budget. And then we were told we could not spend it until they did an accounting and then they froze it, then they unfroze it and they asked us to reappoint the budget. And now they're saying, you know, it's not there. Um, we also had rent that's been allocated through previous years and we even have a copier through the city approved RICO contract that after three years, we still cannot get clear invoices from the city approved contract to mm -hmm. tell us that we're not paying for Dunn's contracts or other neighborhood council's contracts. We get invoices that RICO can't even figure out themselves. And so I've submitted literally almost 30 um, emails, phone calls, even from RICO corporate saying, we cannot figure out your bill yet how can we pay that? So a number of this unsubmitted things or part of what's submitted is gonna have mess of a paperwork to try mm -hmm. to figure out. So we want a clear understanding that there's some kind of appeals process or common sense process to sit down with the neighborhood councils. Literally, we may be in the point that 25% of our budget for this year and expenses that we are on the hook for for contract through city employees are stripped out and we not only have no money for the rest of the year, but now we're in the hole for next year because 26,000 was taken out of rollover. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the next speaker is Laura Myers, yes, I'm Laura. followed by Cindy Hench. Okay, I'm Laura Myers. Um, I'm trying to be more like a sorority girl and friendly. Many of us are really, really angry. It would have been absolutely impossible for every neighborhood council on every um, funding request to follow the rules because if you read your own packet, there's two sets of rules just in the last three weeks. And, they, and the checklist doesn't match what's on the demand warrant. I actually, in turning in a project, went through everything and every rule, made my own checklist, combining all the checklists, and submitted everything, and I was redundant on one project. I, was trying, I am trying to facilitate a partnership between our neighborhood council, a city department, and a nonprofit. That's one of our laudable goals, and it's proving almost impossible. I'm hoping it will be funded. Even in the memos that went out, it wasn't clear. Are we a committed project or a contract? What's the definition of either one? I think the folks at Dunn are working really, really hard, but they're also doing a lot of decision making by the seat of their pants. Um, cobbling together was a phrase used today. It's a real problem. and. The last thing I want to address, the same thing with Venice Neighborhood Council and Russell. Um, an arbitrary decision was made that starting on July 1, when we started spending money, even if it was for projects that had been budgeted 
long ago and far since, it was not deemed rollover money, it was deemed current money. So now my project, and I don't mean personal, the project I'm working on has been deemed a rollover project because even though it was meant for this coming, this spring. So it's a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Cindy Hench, followed by Glenn Bailey. Cindy Hench from Westchester, Playa Neighborhood Council. Um, I feel for you guys. I'm a CPA, took a company through a bankruptcy. I know what you guys are in, you know, dealing with. And to hear us talk about our little peanuts of money from our neighborhood councils has got to be really frustrating. But it's not peanuts to the communities. Um, I, every time I hear this department called the neighborhood empowerment, I just sort of cringe right now because this discussion about the rollovers has been anything but empowering. Initially, we, you've heard this already, we were told um, that the rollovers were frozen, not because of our fault. I know how much our rollover is to the penny. It's reconciled. But it was frozen, and then in November it was we were told it was unfrozen, just submit a new budget. We did. And so we've gone on our merry way, and then we're told it's frozen again, and, and we don't know what to do. So we didn't approve the projects that we've talked about. There aren't going to be discussions at board level and approvals at committee, because as a responsible finance person, you don't approve projects that you don't have money for. So if the money is frozen, I think it's, it's um, a little scary that what your, the council is doing is encouraging the neighborhood councils to act irresponsibly in this regard. Because if we had had a stack of projects approved that we didn't have rollover money for, then we'd have a bunch of people counting on getting the money that we can't fulfill the promise. So any time a project came to us, we said, no, it's on hold, come back to us later. So um, this policy doesn't make any sense, as it's stated, to pay, um, to completely change the historical policy of basically a, a first in, first out in terms of the spending. It's my position that in November when I got that letter and in December when I submitted the budget, all the spending should be applied against the rollover funds like it's always been. So we've got a, a little mess on our hands and I think that it's challenging for you guys at a very, very high level to make these policies that create a real mess down on the streets. Thank you. Uh, final speaker on this matter is Glenn Bailey. Good afternoon, Glenn Bailey, Encino Neighborhood Council. Um, I s spoke in my one minute last week to you about some problems uh, associated with this that I think several of the previous speakers have referred to, and I asked for your assistance in getting some clarification. That has, and, and by that I meant going through, I guess, done, but that has not been forthcoming. Um, so we got a memo dated February 24th, which happened to be the night of our neighborhood council that's stating that there was a deadline of March 10th. Um, tomorrow. Um, then there was another memo that came out March 1st giving a deadline of March 8th. You know, it was okay to change the deadline if it was a later deadline, but to make it an earlier deadline, and it was announced to all of our board members that night, the 24th. I object to that. I think that's wrong. Um, the clarification is I had it described to you that we had submitted demand warrants last fiscal year in June. They weren't paid till July. The monies were coming out of this fiscal year's money. And that needs to be reconciled, I believe, backwards to the rollover. There's no procedure in, that I could see in the instructions that were sent and forms to fill out or just should automatically be done. You don't need to create more paperwork for something that's self-evident, which was paperwork already submitted on earlier and then paid late. That wasn't our fault necessarily, or if it is, explain that it is. But go back and just retroactively mark that as into the rollover monies and be done with it and just get that taken care of, okay? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's no action uh, necessary on this item, uh, so we'll ask Dunn to report back at the next meeting with a little bit more detailed analysis, both of the claims that have come in and accounting for them. And if you have the if you are able to address some of the concerns that have been raised and questions that have been answered, and you can raise those, come back next week and address some of those. That would be uh, very helpful too. Uh, okay, so that brings us to item three, which um, we're going to be continuing until the next meeting. Uh, but for the record, let's go ahead and read it and see if there are any. We do have some cards on three. 
Item number three is a done CAO reports relative to the rollover, rollover policy and recommendations to include a report reporting process to either Bonk or the City Council. I have one card on that, Mr. McQuiston. Uh, we are going to be hearing this at the next meeting, if you would prefer. Thank you. Uh, so we'll be continuing that until the next meeting. Um, jam, 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 jam. And uh, likewise, item four uh, will be continuing, but if you could read that for the record. Done report relative to an enforcement policy for the Neighborhood Council Bank card system. And we have no cards on that, but we will be continuing that at our next meeting. That brings up uh, item number five. Motion Zine Perry relative to the request for the city clerk to report back to the Education Neighborhoods Committee on the elections, elections process for the board elections uh, for 2010 election cycle, including voter turnout and city resources expended per election. Madam Clerk, welcome back. Good afternoon. June Lagme, Office of the City Clerk, and with me is uh, Isaias Cantu with our Elections Division, uh, specific for Neighborhood Councils. So I have exciting uh, information to relay. On March 2nd, we held our first election in Region A. Uh, this, this would be for the neighborhoods of Canoga Park, Chatsworth, Granada Hills North, Granada Hills South, North Hills West, Northridge East, Northridge West, Porter Ranch, West Hills, Winnetka, and Woodland Hills Warner Center. Um, there were a total of 11 neighborhood councils for this region. There were 43 ballot type, uh, ballot styles that were voted upon, 192 board seats, and 216 certified candidates. We deployed 45 poll workers, 14 vehicles, two supply trucks. We uh, afforded two phone rooms, one for poll workers and one for the public, seven phone operators. The Neighborhood Council Volunteer Poll Worker Program was utilized. We did receive a total of 14 applications. However, not one of the 14 wished to work in this particular region. Um, financially, of the 1.9 million budgeted for the 2010 Neighborhood Council election cycle, we have spent, as of today, $567,000. That's about 30%. Um, this, however, should not be construed to be the amount spent on Region A, because a lot of pre-work has been done for the entire uh, regimen of neighborhood councils. So it really won't be till the end of the cycle that we'll be able to give you anything close to how much each region um, you know, cost. Um, Isaias will go into a little bit more detail for you, but um, at the conclusion of uh, the presentation and any questions that you might have, um, I would ask that you um, note and file our presentation and also uh, request us to come back at the conclusion of the cycle with a complete after action report and uh, identification of potential cost saving activities as recommended by Mr. Zine's motion. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Isaias Cantu. I'm with the Election Division, and I brought packets for each one of the uh, committee members. This will give you a chance to see what the actual um, stakeholders had in front of them when they went to, to the polling location on March 2nd. Correct. The packets contain <coughs> three different uh, minor packets. The first is North Hills West, and it contains the stakeholder registration form that was used by voters to vote, um, actually to register to vote on Election Day. North Hills West was the uh, lowest turnout neighborhood council uh, neighborhood council with 47 voters. The next packet oh, is What's for the population there. Population, I don't have that number with me, um, but I can get that to your office. But a total of 47. Correct. Total of voters. Correct. Wow. And how many folks did we have assigned there? At uh, North Hills West, I believe 45. we had three. <laughs> we had three. Three. Three staff members assigned to North Hills West. Additionally, I've also included the packet for the highest turnout neighborhood council, which is Woodland Hills Warner Center, which I believe wow. uh, Councilman Zine voted at. Yes, mm. I did, multiple times. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not Thought I was in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either. 
And we did not hear that. So after, after having been, uh, after submitting your stakeholder registration form, a voter at each one of the polling locations would be issued a ballot. Now across the 11 neighborhood councils, we had the 40-some different ballot styles. So according to how you registered, would determine what ballot you received on election day. What do you mean? So every neighborhood council has a different ballot voting model, which would dictate who can vote for who on that neighborhood council. <laughs> for example, Woodland Hills has multiple ballots. Right. And so a, a business a stakeholder would be able to, would have to register as a business stakeholder in order to be able to vote on the business stakeholder ballot. Whereas other neighborhood councils like uh, North Hills West might have one ballot and oh, anyone wow. that established stakeholder status would wow. be able to vote for that. That's what we mean ballot. by 45 different ballot wow. styles. So if you're a business and you live in the district, could you vote twice? It depends on the neighborhood council. Some neighborhood councils do allow you to receive multiple ballots, others restrict you to one. So upon voting wow. the ballot, the stakeholders would submit that into the ballot, a box, and that would be taken back to Piper Technical Center where we counted them. Uh, the very next business day. I did include in each one of your packets the results for those two neighborhood councils so you could see the tally. Wow. Uh, pending are still the official results we'll be <laughs> issuing on Thursday. Wow. Now I know that the wow. committee has also requested wow. very key information regarding the number of volunteers that have signed up to work at these polls. So I've included that as the third packet on there. Wow. It includes the um, the people that we've assigned for the upcoming regional elections. Now, although we have had 14 people sign up to be poll workers, only of those, only eight of those have actually uh, accepted to work at definite neighborhood councils. Wow. And that list is, again, included inside of these packets. It's, uh, it is region by region at what neighborhood council those individuals were assigned to. What was the population that, that voted in Woodland Hills? The population was actually, for how Woodland Hills, was, turnout was 565. That was actual voters. That's not actual ballot cast. They came and they didn't cast the ballot? And what was the staff there? Some might have been, uh, I'll, I'll, the first question, some might have received ballots, but yeah. they were provisional ballots, so we had to hold them. Mm -hmm. um, some were write-in votes. Um, and some were vote by mail. In reference to the number of staff members that we had at Woodland Hills Warner Center, we initially started our day with six staff members there and ended up with 11 because of the unexpected voter turnout and the great outreach performed by Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council. Now what about Canoga Park, Winnetka? Canoga Park, Canoga Park and Winnetka. In reference to actual turnout? Re Region A. Okay. I didn't see those in here. Actual turnout for Canoga Park was 96 voters. Okay. And Winnetka? Winnetka was 97. Okay. And what about staff at those? Uh, for Winnetka, I don't have the number of staff members that were assigned to that, but I will get back on that. And you mentioned Canoga Park? Yes. I believe Canoga Park um, expected low turnout, so we had three staff members at that polling place. And again, we staff polling places according to the estimated turnout, where we approximate using the 2005 to 2008 election turnouts for those neighborhood councils. And based on certain criteria, meaning how many turnout they had during that period, we ascertain whether a low t whether the neighborhood council's low turnout, medium turnout, or high turnout. And were they consistent? Yes. And the hours, no, I, so. I know that Noble Park was, they closed, they weren't open at 8. The hours were 12 to 8? The hours, eight? the hours differ for every neighborhood council. I can't tell you off the top of my head what it was for, for Canoga Park. Yeah, I went there to vote and they were closed. It, oh. it, Every neighborhood council uh, designates their own polling place hours. For Canoga Park, their voting hours were from 12 noon to 6 p.m. 12 to 6. And then the other one's 12, 12 to 8. For Woodland Hills. Woodland Hills was 2 to 8. 2 to 8. Okay. Yeah. And Winnetka was 2 to 8.
issue, and I voted at uh, Woodland Hills, and I also voted in uh, West Hills. I voted at both locations. Mm -hmm. One is a stakeholder, and one is a resident. Uh, and, and I commend the staff, because they were very patient. They checked ID, that, but when you went to Woodland Hills, you had all these ballots, and it was trying to figure out what's what. And so that was, that was rather cumbersome. But my concern is, when we have a turnout of 47, 96, 97 in communities that have thousands of people. And I know there was outreach by the neighborhood councils in the newspaper. Uh, they posted signs. And then 565, uh, obviously Woodland Hills Warner Center had the largest turnout. But if you look at the population, did we, can we get a percentage of what the population of voting? We have that statistic we based can, upon the community size? We can compile that using certification numbers. But that's, that's that the closest we can come to actually. It's probably going to be like 5 or 6%. Well, it'll, it'll actually be less than that because yeah, you have yeah, stakeholders. Have you have stakeholders beyond the number of residents. Three you have business three, owners. Yeah. You have, a, a, depending on how stakeholders are defined in a particular neighborhood council. Right. I think, the, I think the clerk's office did a great job. A lot of those folks are on overtime, I assume, the ones at 8 o'clock and after. And no overtime was expended in, in implementing these elections. You guys are awesome. Bless you. All time where Bless you for that. That's amazing. Great. Thank you. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I think the, the clerk's job has done a tremendous job under really extraordinarily difficult circumstances that have been given to you. But I think that, you know, some of these initial results really indicate um, that whereas the, the election process cost some $2 million to pursue, uh, that was money that was not able to be spent for outreach, for example. And so as a result in Woodland Hills Warner Center, elections, we had of the 22 seats eligible for election in that neighborhood council, 10 of those seats either had no candidates or one candidate running on a post, half of, almost half the seats. And I think, you know, the, the glaring lack of or inadequate outreach that was able to be done because of insufficient funds, in part because it was being used for the election itself. I think indicates to us that, indicates to me anyway, that we need to revisit the policy uh, following the cycle to really f figure out how we can focus on running these elections in a more, perhaps a less formal, more cost efficient way and then divert more of those resources to neighborhood services that the neighborhood councils provide and, and outreach uh, prior to the elections, yeah. my view. But, but, but I, uh, and uh, Madam Clerk, you've indicated coming, you, you would propose coming back after the election cycle is done so you have the mm -hmm. full benefit full of all that in analysis. information. Yes. I think that that's very important for, for us to do because mm -hmm. it's clear in my mind we're going to have to revisit this policy and recraft it. And I think now that we've already gone down this road and expended so much of the money, we ought to at least get the benefit of this I hate to use the word, but this experiment, <laughs> uh, and uh, and figure out how to craft a more effective policy for coming elections. Yeah. Ms. Hunt? Yeah, I was just going to, um, so the next uh, election is March 27th, correct? 20th. March 20th. 20th, okay. Um, any, anything that was glaring to you? I know you, I don't know how much time you've had to completely analyze, but anything glaring in terms of what worked really well and maybe what didn't work well that you're actually going to, uh, maybe tweak before the 20th? Every election has its own um, heart-gripping moments, and uh, um, she'll never forgive me, but my, my executive officer twisted her ankle that morning, and she oh. still lugged out to all the polling locations and oh, wow. pitched in, and so I'm um, very proud of her for doing that. Um, but that's what makes it, it, uh, elections exciting. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Izzy, maybe you want to go through some of the particular uh, challenges which we have um, already built in some, some fail-safe for, for next time. Yes. Uh, immediately following the elections, we did perform a debrief with all staff to mm -hmm. incorporate all of the uh, criticisms mm -hmm. uh, that we did receive during the day because we see those as opportunities for creating solutions. And during the day, we did find a couple of issues that we've developed uh, systematic solutions for. The first being, at some cases, based on unexpected voter turnout, we did have, we didn't have enough poll workers working at some locations. Given were West Hills and Woodland Hills Warner Center, 
those were two very specific locations. What we did on the fly was move poll workers from low turnout into the low and medium turnout neighborhood council elections to Woodland Hills and West Hills. We've already prepared for performing that same task for the upcoming elections. Additionally, that also brought about the issue of not having enough ballots at some polling locations. So we've already developed a, a means of printing ballots on the fly and delivering them. Mm -hmm. And uh, incorporating time for uh, what that might mean for neighborhood councils that are further away from our uh, Piper Technical Center. For example, it'll take us longer to get to the valley or to the harbor than it would to get to Greater Echo Park Elysian Neighborhood Council. So we've, uh, we've developed more and better approximate ballot number production at the onset to be able to address that uh, for the harbor and more uh, outlying areas. Um, uh, additionally, supplies, we've added additional supplies that were necessary for poll workers. Uh, simple supplies, post-it notes, binder clips, uh, some Ziploc bags. Um, Ziploc bags? Pardon? Oh. What are the Ziploc, Ziploc bags? bags. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Um, because we end up putting paper clips in them and different binder clips so they're not rattling around in our supply boxes. So we try to, to develop our supply boxes to mimic what we do in municipal elections mm -hmm. so that they're clean, they're organized, mm -hmm. and they can easily be put back together at the end of the night. And reused. Exactly. That is one of the key words that we've used, reuse. Everything that we yeah, don't use exactly. during the first election is made generic so that we can reuse it for the following elections. Very good. Uh, we've also updated our, the information that will be available on our kiosks and voting booths. We did have issues regarding the size of maps that we're 11 by 17 at these first elections that we've now increased to size 24 by 36 and will be available for people to be able to say, this is where I live. And it'll be easier for them to, to be able to identify what district they live in and thereby vote. Um, as well as um, additional signage provided where some of the polling places we found had great parking facilities, but they were somewhat far distance from the entrance of the polling place. So we've added more signage into our supply boxes to be able to address that. Because we don't like to walk anywhere. And one of the, one of the other concerns is, and being the councilman for the district, you know a lot of people, I looked at these ballots, a lot of these places, a lot of these people had no idea who they were. That's true. And there was really no idea of what they represented or what they would bring to the neighborhood council. There was their names, who are these people? That was another concern that, you know, and, and they don't have leaflets, they don't, I mean, they took out ads in paper about the election, but when you look at, for example, vote for one, you had one, two, three, with this particular one, five, I know one of the, I know two of the names on there, but the other ones, and there's no way for them to really, unless they go knock on doors or spend money on materials, who are they? That's the, that's a concern. I don't know how a neighborhood council were able to generate that identity of what that person's gonna bring to the table to represent that neighborhood. In, the, in reference to that, we did provide all candidate statements that were submitted by all candidates on the kiosk, the informational kiosk available to all stakeholders to be able to view. Additionally, given the experience that, that we learned from having you in our polling place, we've also added the candidate list to our informational kiosk so anyone that comes into the polling place can identify um, what candidate they're interested in voting for so that they can establish their stakeholder status uh, uh, accordingly and be able to vote the correct ballot that they're interested in voting. When you go into, for example, in area three, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and three, 13 ballot statements. I don't know if people are gonna take the time to, I, I just think it's. What's your point? It, it's gotta be real simple for the folks to look and say, I want Paul Picori to be my council representative. That's what I'm talking about, versus A, B, C, D, or E. I, I, and the seven ballots to me, when they have spread on those tables, yeah. trying to figure out what are you. And when it comes to the ballot styles, that is something that's defined by the neighborhood council, and yeah, we just follow them, through. Right? Makes they, it, yeah, they, it's up to them. They're, they're, it's not imposed by the city clerk. No, I'm just saying for the residents and for the folks that may get turned off because you got super low turnouts, even at 565, for that community, there's thousands of people in that community. I'm just talking about 
getting them to the polls, number one, and get them to vote for somebody who is going to represent them. I mean, when we run for office, obviously, we send out mail, we do this, we do that, we knock on doors, we go to forms. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, you know, being the frugal guy I am, I look at $1.9 million and I'm looking at the results of the $1.9 million. Again, no disrespect to you folks, because the clerk did a great job. But it's what, did we, what, did we, what, did, what was our return for our investment when it comes to really connecting with those neighborhoods and the folks in those neighborhoods? And obviously, I was concerned because it was, you know, my district. But, and, and just not to have you uh, think of things on the fly uh, necessarily, but just as by way of example, be, because one of the challenges is the diversity of neighborhood councils and the fact that there is no uniformity in definition of stakeholders and bylaws and so on, um, would, it, would it be a feasible alternative to have a clerk's office monitor at an election, but have the neighborhood councils run the election as they see fit? Um, you know, have the clerk there to resolve disputes, but have them use those post-its or pieces torn up pieces of notebook paper or whatever to write the name on, put it in a hat, count them, and have a clerk as an overseer to make sure that there's no, <laughs> you know, fraud or, uh, or you know, to resolve disputes. The hybrid version. We talked about that hybrid yeah. version. Remember? Remember? We talked about that. And I, I know that that's counter to everything that your professionalism, you know, usually uh, mandates, but this is a hybrid government kind of deal, so. Holly Walcott with the Office of the City Clerk, I think your point is well taken and something we should look at for the next cycle. I think we're too far gone and too far yeah. down the road this term that it's something we can we can discuss for the next cycle. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I, that's certainly what I mean. I don't mean to suggest we should start doing that now. We've already been down that road and discussed that, and, and I think we're resolved. To, we're committed to this cycle. But as we look forward, um, I think you look at these numbers and you think this is probably something that would be manageable by the, by the councils themselves. We will definitely look at all alternatives. Um, one of the ideas out there that I would like to pursue, <coughs> and I know um, June would as well, is uh, similar to the Honolulu model, going electronic. Computer um, or phone. And I was going to ask you about that, or with touchscreen voting. The there, challenge there, there is with the different ballot different. styles, it, it, there's well, a question the of cost effectiveness there. The, the challenge is more actually the registration and the defi stakeholder definition yeah. is what the real challenge is. Um, Honolulu uses registered voters. Is there and clearly, if you've got shop owners and what have you. But we need to think through that. We need to be creative. We need to find a way. Um, but again, we're looking at two years and taking all suggestions and all ideas and uh, well, coming up with the best one. I, I think the and course that I would like to see is we complete this cycle. We have the after action report that uh, when this is done. We work closely with uh, the neighborhood councils uh, in conference to try to come up with a, uh, a system that will allow um, the greatest degree of um, accountability, but still the least amount of money, uh, so that that uh, can be spent more on on outreach and, and other outreach things. Outreach is probably one of the most critical yeah. pieces in in driving voter turnout. Which, and I think it also goes far in addressing Mr. Zine's concern about people not knowing who these people are. If you're doing outreach, you're getting the community activists involved, and um, people will know who they are. Um, the, although the ship has sailed as far as this year, and I'm not suggesting that we make changes this year. We've already beaten that one to death. But are there cost efficiencies that can still be realized for example, by a greater utilization in the subsequent elections of volunteers. What can we do? Mr. Bailey has mentioned num a number of times the volunteer uh, situation. Is there something we can do to increase volunteer activity levels in the elections? Still well, I know that um, a number of the electeds and the mayor's office have uh, come forward with volunteer applications, and we would only ask that uh, a, we welcome them wholeheartedly, and B, get them to us as soon as possible because there's a, at least a three to four week lead in period before an election where we have to amass them on a database, train them, uh, and so forth. In other words, 
what is most frustrating for us is to get a list of volunteers the night before the election when it's really so late that we can hardly be able to incorporate them. Um, so certainly from all quarters, from your offices, from Dunn, from any quarter, we welcome volunteers. Um, we tell them how many times we've done the e-blast and so forth. We have done, we have held nine informational meetings where we provided those forms and made them available for people to apply. 14 stakeholder kind of information meetings where again we've had that information available. We've had the application available online. We've performed e-blast uh, at least eight on our part to all of the neighborhood <coughs> council designated individuals. We've also sent out the e-blast via Dunn's e-blast system. Um, we've gone to each of the neighborhood councils and provided the applications. Um, we're, we're, in fact, yesterday we sent out another e-blast. We just keep sending out the information, requesting for volunteers. Um, uh, maybe there's an applicant too. Yeah. Maybe there's an applicant. It's not that you're not doing what you can do or we do what we can do. Local elections, we're lucky if we get 16% of the people to vote. And you know, there's a lot of apathy out there. Okay. Somebody else is problem. That's what a lot of people think. It's sad, but that's the reality we have to admit to. As I pointed out, in Woodland Hills, nearly half of the positions had no one or one person running, yeah. let alone volunteering. The, I mean, we didn't have, even have enough people to run. So uh, there is a lot of apathy. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Very yes, good job. It is. Um, very we'll be glad to report head. when the cycle is over and give you a comprehensive analysis. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. One, so one quick clarification yes. only because I, I misspoke earlier when I mentioned there was no overtime performed. It was very minimal. The majority of, of city clerk staff adjusted time for the elections. So we hope they went appreciate the efforts. After all that. <laughs> or, or two. Uh, take public comment on item five now. Uh, the first speaker is Glenn. In fact, we have two speakers. The first is Glenn Bailey, and uh, the other is uh, Ida Talawa. Mr. Bailey. Back again, Glenn Bailey, Encino Neighborhood Council. First of all, I would like to correct the record. I signed up to be a volunteer poll worker at the Valley Congress of Neighborhood Councils on May 30th. That's where, after this committee uh, requested the city clerk to initiate that effort, there were a number of people that signed up on May 30th. I don't know what's been going on since then, and February 18th, which is the first time that I received an email from the city clerk that provided the form. Now, no one ever said anything about a form from May until February. You had to fill out a form and that you had to ten attend a mandatory training and you had to submit the form 30 days prior to the election. May 18th was 12 days prior to the Region A election. No way you could comply. But even so, I had received a few phone calls going back to December, January. I said, I will volunteer for Region A election. No one ever told me about a form. No one ever told me about a mandatory training until I called, may I finish? Please. Until I called the day after I received this email, I said, I got this email, mandatory training and the election's 11 days away. And I said, when is the mandatory training? He said, oh, we haven't set the date yet. So my point was, they may have run the election fine with the forms and with the staff they had there, but they didn't need 45 city clerk personnel. They could have done it with one city clerk per neighbor council, 11, and truly ramped up since May 30th of last year, or actually it was before that, that this committee asked them to do that. I don't know what's been going on since then, but that was the first email that we got that had the form May 18th. Now the mandatory trainings down at Piper, down at downtown here. If you're a volunteer in the Valley, are you going to come all the way downtown to take a training to, to work a six-hour shift? That's not convenient. And if you're in the harbor, would you come up to Piper Center? So organize it by region, have the trainings in the region. And there needs to be a lot more effort, and it should have been going on a lot more actively. Also, a press release was sent out the day of the election. I can forward it to you. The day of the election, a press release was sent out by the city clerk. Vote today. I think you know that's fine, but it should have been done earlier. And the candidate and stakeholder information meetings, um, I don't think have been adequately um, publicized um, 
collaboratively, both city clerk, the neighborhood councils, et cetera. It's not too late. It's late, okay. but it's not too late. And I think that you should have them come back, not at the end of this process, but you know, maybe after the next election again, or maybe midway. Don't wait to the very end when it's really too late. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, since Mr. Bailey has raised this issue a number of times, if the clerk's office could identify the people who were signed up at the Valley Alliance and Neighborhood Councils in May. Uh, has outreach been done to, to those uh, people, and can we get them into the loop? Um, yes, we can. Um, I believe there was a specific, it sounds like it's a communication breakdown with Mr. It Daly. Like we did it, yeah. contact him several times. Our understanding was that he was only willing to work with CETA. I, I don't need to specify Mr. Bailey. I just mean the list of people who signed right. up. And the reason there was no we do the training scheduled was because we didn't have anybody signed up for the region election, so that's why there was no okay. training scheduled. It, there was no point in scheduling any training until we had volunteers. Right. Okay. And each one of the committee members' packets has this list which in details every stakeholder who signed up and has been assigned per region and by neighborhood council assignment. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Talala. Thank you. My name is Ida Talala. I am with the Greater Echo Park Alicia Neighborhood Council. I am an elected member of the Neighborhood Council. I would like to state that there is insufficient outreach, and I think that rests with the Neighborhood Council. I think if in two years you haven't reached out to the community, the community is not going to be there. Also, candidates, no matter who they are, must sign a statement or give the public some information to go by. Now it is an optional event. I also think that there needs to be a neutral body so that the neighborhood council that's involved in re-election is not involved in outreach, which might be biased, but there needs to be another neutral body if not a creation of a neutral body to deal with the elections. I also think that our neighborhood elections are far too costly, and I think a better system needs to be worked on beginning now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, did Mr. McQuiston have a comment on number five, too? I, yeah. Did I? Okay. I, I didn't see your card, but come, come right up, sir. Jim McQuiston, I've been a, a poll worker at many NC elections. I've also monitored many. I must say at the first downtown neighborhood council election, there were three candidates for the position of homeless, and there were two votes cast. Uh, I am not surprised at the turnouts. Uh, the, the, usually we figure about one-tenth of one percent. You figure, uh, w counting everyone, the stakeholders, you'll, you'll run, if, if there are 20,000 residents, you figure 40,000 in the neighborhood council. And at 40,000, you look at those numbers, 47 versus 40,000, what is that? A little over one-tenth of one percent. Uh, we, we, Originally, we're doing it with volunteers. The League of Women Voters did it, and we can go back to a system like that. All right, thank you, sir, very much. And then uh, that brings, so on, on this matter, we're gonna continue this matter in committee without objection, and uh, then we're gonna request that the city clerk, following all of the elections, provide a written report back detailing uh, um, Detailing the results of the elections, which, as, as you uh, indicated, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, but also at the next regular meeting of, of this committee, two weeks from now, um, if you could please provide uh, a brief, very brief report about how we can utilize volunteers to a greater degree in the coming elections or what your plans are to do so. I think that's an important uh, step for us to, to try to take. 
So uh, with that, that's our last action item without objection. Um, that's what uh, we will do. And then that finally brings us to general comment. Uh, and the only card I have on general comment uh, is Ms. Talala, if you'd like to speak again, you have another opportunity uh, to speak. And for those of you who aren't sticking around, thank you all very much. <laughs> Ms. Talala. Um, I did a report card on neighborhood councils based on the audit that was provided by the controller. And I found out in terms of performance that 17 neighborhood councils had failed to file one or more fiscal quarterly reports. 82 neighborhood councils had one or more compliance failures, meaning cash advance violations, split purchase, and had exceeded their credit limit. That left only seven neighborhood councils out of 89 that were in compliance. And that record for the amount you are expending on neighborhood councils is not justified expenditure because there are programs in the community that are being cut that deserve funding that won't get it. And I am very concerned with what is being expended given the performance record. And I've got the record here. Thank you very much. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.